church family. It's so good to have you here with us this morning. Thanks for spending your long weekend with us. That's really good. And uh, for those of you that are footy fans, what a weekend for Crows and Port supporters. It's been quite a, yeah, I know, 10, 10. Okay, so let's get excited. You know what? It's so good to be together worshipping a God that knows us and loves us, a God that is present, a God that is work. And uh, we just love being together as his family. So if you're a guest here this morning, really warm welcome to you. We love having you here with us. And uh, we're going to just get together. We're going to sing a bit. We're going to hear the word. And we're just going to experience what it means to be in community. So let's stand together.
out, singing out, speaking out the name of Jesus. that you are a God that is above and in all things. You are a God that is present here. You are a God that has come to bind the brokenhearted. You are a God that has come to rejoice with us and celebrate with us in those times when we can really celebrate the things that you have done. Father, I pray for whoever and however people have come this morning. As we've sung that together, declaring your goodness and your worthiness and your faithfulness and your presence. I pray that now over us as a community, over us as your people, Father. We're reminded again and again of your beautiful character. Reminded again and again of the goodness that you have for us. And it's not just goodness for goodness sake, but it is actually about us having the best lives that we can based on a God that knows us and loves us and a God that is present right here in this place, right here in this situation. And we thank you for all of that in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. And good morning, everyone. How are we today? I hope you're ready for a good day. Uh, it's great to be here and to be with each other and to be worshipping our Lord together this morning. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we want to give you a very special warm welcome and uh, to let you know that there are these things. Uh, if you haven't gotten one of these things before, a welcome card, make sure you grab one. I think they're in the foyer there. Feel free to just grab one, take one. Uh, most important thing on the card is the QR code. Uh, feel free to scan the QR code and that will take you down a rabbit trail of all sorts of possibilities. Uh, lots of things that you can find out about what's going on here at Playford United Church and around our community and how you can connect with us. Uh, we would love to, um, if, you, if you go there, follow the trail, put your email address in, that will come to me. Uh, and then I'll add you to our email list and you'll be able to get all the info that you need uh, about what's going on. Now, if you are visiting with us this morning, we would love uh, to spoil you just a little bit. And so after the service, join us for coffee. Uh, and if you're visiting with us this morning, coffee is on the house. Coffee is free. If you don't like coffee, there's milkshakes too. Uh, or hot chocolates, or chai, or all sorts of things. But make sure you grab one of those before you go. Uh, now, I have some updates for us this morning. Uh, we have been trying to keep, uh, keep in constant updates with the finances and the, the 
how we're going with things in terms of the, the loan, the, the mortgage on the, the property here. And I have some, some I have a little slide just to give you a visual picture of what's been going on. So uh, we, uh, we said that our previous debt, I think this was last year sometime in 2022, way back in 2022, uh, we had a debt on the property of $208,000. Uh, now that's, you know, that's a small house loan. Uh, a very small house, uh, and uh, you know we we had a, an interest-free period, and that was coming to an end. And so we thought we need to start to pay this down because the more you can pay off before you get charged interest, then obviously the cheaper it is and the better it is financially. So we had a previous debt of two hundred and eight thousand dollars. I'm just going to open up my notes here so that so that I can follow along with Anne. Uh, at the end of twenty. 2022, Synod and the property services team called a few of us in for a meeting to give us some updates, and this is what they did for us. First thing they did was they released the Mance Fund. There was this fund that was sitting there earning a little bit of interest for us, uh, but that was worth $135,600, and they said, look, we're going to take that, we're going to wipe that, and put that towards the debt, and just wipe that off the debt. Uh, Part of the process of when, when they do that kind of thing, there's a 15% fee that goes to Synod. They decided that they would like to bless us by waiving that fee. So we got all of that as well. Uh, and then we had this land that went up for sale and uh, we were kind of hoping it would sell for heaps and heaps and heaps and they would give us the change because there was a previous debt that was, that was paying off. Well, they did sell it and the leftover amount was 20, 26600 and they said, we want to bless you by giving you that back as well. So that left us in January 2023 with a debt of $37,500. Down from two hundred and eight thousand dollars. That's pretty good. And we've got until July the first to pay as much of that off before they start charging us interest and repayments and all that sort of thing. So we had. I'm going to ask Anne to hold off on the next slide. Uh, we had a challenge put before us earlier this year to see how much of that 37500 we could pay off. And about, I think, two weeks ago, I think it was, I announced that we were down to about $25,000 to go with five weeks to go. And I jokingly said, who's got, that's 25000 divided by five weeks is 5000 a week, who's got $5,000? Uh, it, was, it was totally off the cuff. Uh, but I've got to tell you, since five weeks ago, there's been some incredible donations have been made, um, some checks, some cash, some, some just incredibly generous giving. So press the button one more time. So our previous debt of $208,000, less than six months, well, about six months ago, I can announce today that the current debt that we have with three weeks to go until July the 1st is, drum roll, <laughs> so it's down to about $10,000 with three weeks to go. And we, I think Synod was so surprised, they sent us an email during the week updating us of the exact figure and, uh, and said, so, um, is it actually going to be necessary for us to write up a loan document or not? Uh, because I think they've got a sneaky suspicion that we could potentially pay off that 10000 in the next three weeks and there'll be no need for any loans and repayments at all. Anyway, so that is the incredible good news and also the challenge before us in the next few weeks to see how much of that we can get rid of as well and maybe go into the second half of the year completely debt-free. So that's good news. That's uh, something to pray about and something to consider as you look at your budget over the next few weeks. All right, that's, that's that one. A couple more announcements. Uh, coming up, I will pray about that and give praise to God in just a moment anyway. Uh, a couple of other quick things. Uh, Connect Camp Playford United Church, Connect Family Camp coming up in November. Uh, 
block those dates out, make sure that you're available. It's going to be a fantastic time. Now, Kathy Walker, she's still standing up here because she's the contact. So now you can put a, a face to a name. Any questions about camp, you can go and see Kathy. Uh, there's different accommodation options as well. So if you're going, oh, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know if I want to be put in the dorm with another family or I don't know if I want to do that. You can talk to Kathy about accommodation options. There's lots of different things. Uh, you can ask her about the fees, you can ask her about payment plans, all those sorts of things. But put that in your diary. We would love to have everyone at camp. And there's room for everyone. Uh, and can I just say, if, if financially you go, wow, that's, that's a, an expensive thing. If you're finding it difficult, come and speak to us. Because we would hate to think that the finances is the only thing stopping you from coming. And we would love to, I know there's already been people who say, look, I'd like to put some money towards helping somebody else. So let us know if it's, if it's a burden. Uh, we'd just love to spend the weekend away all together having a great time. All right, now I'm going to hand to Kathy, who has an announcement. Changing hats. I get to um, share some wonderful news with you. In two weeks' time, we're going to have a congregational meeting. I'm hyping it up. Yay! Yay. So, um, Uniting Church Synod requires us to have at least two congregational meetings a year. So, we have our AGM budget um, meeting at the end of the year. So, this, is our, this will be our second meeting for the, for in, to make up the two meetings for the year, which will be in two weeks' time on the 25th of June, straight after the service. Um, it will mainly be an information-type meeting. So, there will be a further update on the loan. Hopefully it'll be zero that day. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, there'll also be a non-political statement around the yes referendum. Um, key events for the second half of the year. A property update. Um, talk about a leadership grant and also a presentation on work for the Dole project. Those are the um, information items that will be presented amongst other ones, um, at that meeting in two weeks' time. So if anyone has um, anything that would, they would like to put on the, agenda, on the agenda or would like to discuss at that meeting, please come and see me afterwards. Okay? Beautiful. The yes vote. The voice. The, the, Re the referendum the on the, the voice to the parliament? The voice? Yes. Sorry, I'm reading my notes. Yes, yeah, sorry. That was incorrect. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jason, for that. So it's on the, the voice referendum. So there will be a non-political statement about the voice referendum. Is that better? Thank you very much. All right. Excellent. Good clarification. Back to you. Thank you. Uh, excellent. So that's the announcements for this morning. Uh, why don't we pray? There's some significant things. And, and I know meetings don't get everyone excited. Uh, but I'd love you to plan to be there. Uh, it's, it is a church congregational meeting. It's important for the congregation to actually be there. Um, and uh, th there will be some really exciting things to, to be made aware of on that day. But let's pray and thank God for his goodness to us. Father, we, Lord, we have just sung, Unto your name be praise and blessing and wisdom and power and thanks. And Lord, we're here this morning because you are worthy, because you're worthy of all praise, because you are a good God. Uh, Father, we thank you for your grace toward us. We thank you for your love toward us, your forgiveness, your generosity, your constant pouring out of blessing. Father, would you make us a people uh, who are good stewards of the blessings you give us? Father, we thank you for the news this morning of the, uh, the great... Um, decrease in our loan amount. Uh, Father, we have been praying uh, that you would uh, enable us to pay that off. Uh, and so we give you thanks for that. And Lord, we thank you for the generosity of your people. Um, and we commit the, the rest of that to you as well. And Father, we think of these things Kathy's just mentioned uh, for the upcoming meeting. Father, we pray for wisdom. Uh, we pray for um, the ability to discern well on things. Uh, Father, we want uh, this community here uh, to be a blessing in the wider community of Playford. 
And Father, we know that as we follow your ways, uh, we will be that blessing. And so we give you thanks. This morning we give you thanks that we can gather together. We thank you uh, for the word that we will hear through Pete in a few minutes. Uh, We thank you for the fellowship that we can share after the service. Uh, And Lord, we give you all thanks and praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, children. I believe the children are about to head out to their program. Nick's got some things planned. Kids, it is your time to There's go the up. song, Kids, so you it know is it's your true. Time to go up. Kids, it is your time to go up. Excellent. Kids, 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 hey. Kids, it is your time to go up. Kids, it is your time to go up. Kids, it is your time to go up. Kids, 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 hey. Kids, it is your time to go up. Kids, it is your time to go up. Stand together.
1 says this. It says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me, and this is the line I love, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then goes on to say, Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not light in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, this morning is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Something really beautiful about coming with a humble spirit when we come into this place, a spirit of brokenness and a spirit of um, humility, a spirit where we of surrender, where we allow God to, to speak deep into our hearts reminding us again and again of his goodness and his faithfulness, restoring us and uh, giving us what we need to face every day. Something beautiful about that. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God fall within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, revival embers smoldering, breath of God, fan us into flame. We need a fresh wind. Fragrance of 
Father, thank you for your presence here in this place this morning. Beautiful presence that at this moment is refreshing and restoring and bringing hope. comes to share the word this morning just pray you'll remind us again of who you are and what you have done pray for those of us this morning that have come with heavy hearts and burdens that this beautiful restoring spirit of God will be in people's hearts and over their lives and situations we thank you for being here with us this morning Thank you for being at work in this place. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. Lovely. Thanks, team. It's... uh it's really good to, uh, really good, it's really good, it's excellent in fact, is it me Daryl or is it you or is it us, it's us, could be one of, could be one of us, okay, I will continue, has anyone been in a situation where it's become very apparent that something's happening but you have no idea what's, <laughs> this could be one of those situations. Sorry, I'll just keep talking. No, it's okay. that's okay. No, I've made many mistakes in my time. Not that you're making a mistake. I think you're just working. Has anyone been in a position, a bit similar to this, where you've been in a situation where something was happening, but you actually had no idea what was happening? Ever been in that sort of situation? Your minds are probably raced to your whole life story now, but where you're the one who's missed what's actually going on here. And if you realised what was happening, you, you would have responded differently. Well, a few years ago, I worked as a high school chaplain. And in order, the school liked having me around, which is very positive. The chaplains, the school had no, sorry, the church had no more money to have me around. But the school said, well, listen, why don't we put you on as a groundsman a day a week? And then you'd still be around. And you bring skills to that area, don't you, Pete? Groundsman stuff. <laughs> I just wanted to be around. So I said, yeah, I can do groundsman stuff. Andy, this will intrigue you. Um, it involved, um, well, little things, sweeping leaves, a um, bit of painting, more sweeping of leaves. We're up in the hills, so it was awesome, lots of sweeping of hills. It also involved driving a tractor. <laughs> and if you know anything about Heathfield High, or you've ever been out, it's on Longwood Road, and it's actually set on a hill. So they've got the three-storey building, but there's a bit of a, there's a driveway that goes down to a, a quadrangle. Now it's all beautiful, but it was just, you know, concrete in the day. And then further steps, and then it's down to the ovals and things like that. It's on a hill. And I'd been up, um, uh, the tractor was up on the front lawn. So I should have a picture, but big building, but a front lawn sat here. That was level and onto a driveway. And Errol, who was working with me at the time, said, I just need you to bring the tractor down to the, down to the quadrangle. So I'm puttering along on the tractor on the flat lawn, puttering along. I know how to drive a tractor. I've been taught. Had one quick look over with Errol, I think, just briefly. And then I turned onto what must have been like a 20-degree, 30-degree, about um, 50-metre driveway. And I turned on, I put my foot on the clutch just as I turned the corner there and then started to gather speed and more speed, and more speed. I'm on a tractor driving down a ramp towards a quadrangle where there are students. So I'm riding down this ramp, foot on the clutch, down I go, down I go, and I didn't know how to stop this thing. The tractor is now out of control. And I know actually you're horrified. You're not even finding this funny right about now. And I, you know what? Running through my head is what options do I have? I don't know how to stop it. I didn't know how to stop it. It wasn't stopping. 
And so I knew there was a big quad going on. Thankfully, this was in between lessons. The grace of God in this, infinitely in between lessons. A few kids are in the corners of the quadrangle. And I'm racing down, and, I, and there was a bit of a spoon drain. I hit the spoon drain, stuff flew out of the back of the thing, and I did the biggest U turn you've ever seen as I almost scraped walls as I did a big circle. And I came to a stop somewhere like a squirrely circle in the middle of the quadrangle. <sighs> I checked to see if I was alive. I checked to see if everyone else was alive. A few teachers were looking out from windows of the third story because I heard the kaboom as I hit the spoon drain with this runaway tractor. Does anyone know what my problem was, just if you're familiar with cars? Robert? Yeah, yeah. If you have your foot on the clutch, it doesn't engage the engine in any fashion. You take the foot off the clutch and suddenly your tractor just slows right down and putters down at beautiful... My friends, I was ignorant to what actually was going on. I had no idea what I was doing. All I could do was hang on and hope it somehow would get me to a safe destination. Now, last week we had a story, a beautiful story that took place at the gate of the Temple Beautiful. We've just had Pentecost. The Spirit has come. The people of God are now gathering in new and fresh ways. There is power, there is life. God has visited us in a way that would forever change not just the church, but would change the world. Jesus is still active. Although he has gone, he is still present in and by the Holy Spirit. And the scene that we had last week in Acts chapter 3 was the healing of a man asking for help, asking for finances. And Henry beautifully encourages, he got something that he didn't realize he knew that he needed. He got something so much more than enough just to get him through the next meal. We're told that he was healed. When Peter reached out and took his hand, he was healed. And we're told that his ankles were strengthened and he went around singing and dancing and leaping. We read. Well, the passage we have today follows on a little bit. In fact, directly, should I say, from that a moment. Because the lame man has now been healed and he is holding on to Peter and John. Now, again, this isn't because he was going to fall over. Because the crowds have now gathered and they've now seen that the blind man has been healed and made whole. And that he is hanging on. It's a beautiful thing. It's almost like he's not quite ready yet to enter all of that. And he's looking out at this crowd because the crowd has gathered. Let me read what happens. As the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the entrance that is called Solomon's Porch, greatly amazed. Now, this is a bit that ran down the east side of the temple, a bit of a portico, so it probably had some columns with a roof, a bit of a long veranda type thing. And this was actually in the area that the Gentiles were allowed to enter, at least into this little part of the temple. It was the same place where Jesus taught in this very space. People are now greatly amazed. Now, this is a word that's only used here in the whole of Scripture in this place. So there is something now. Jesus has just been resurrected, right? That wasn't enough to greatly amaze. Pentecost wasn't enough. But this moment has them in a way that they've never experienced before. Greatly amazed. And when Peter saw this, he answered the people, he said, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this man? And why do you stare at us as if by our own power or our own piety, which is our own godliness, how close we are to Jesus, that we made him walk? So what an incredible little moment here. The crowd is amazed. Some of us know our amazement looks like mouths dropped and just staring, cannot believe Others are probably talking amongst themselves. Others are calling things out. And Peter has that beautiful thing. He says, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this man? You can almost imagine, why do you marvel at this man? Almost pointing to him. So drawing more attention to this guy hanging on to him for dear life. And why do you stare at us? You can almost picture him gesturing both ways. Now here's a moment, my friends. Here's a moment of healing in a very public setting. I wonder what your, what your next decision would be, what your next action would be. Well, maybe not surprising if you know anything about Peter. 
he decides there's a sermon in this. I feel a sermon coming on. Now, we saw that when the, when, at, when the Spirit arrived in Acts chapter 2. He also preached into that moment. Well, now, his preaching story, his source is what has just happened. They really don't know what's just happened. But Peter's about to tell them what has just happened. And he says this, The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the creator of life. Wonder where he's pointing now, my friends. You have killed the creator of life whom God has raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and you know. And faith which comes through him has given him perfect health, health in your presence. Now, that's an opening to a message, isn't it? This man has been healed through, and Jesus Christ has been glorified. So straight away, he's saying, you want credit? You want to put credit somewhere? It's to Jesus Christ. The beginning of the message. Don't look at us. We are just people. We are not magicians. We're nothing. And it's not that we walk so close to Jesus that these things just happen wherever we go. He immediately points him to the center of what his message is going to continue to become and continue to be, which is this is through the work of Jesus Christ. He's glorified. And then he tells them, you remember Jesus Christ, the one that you... Did you hear that quite clearly? There were four things he said that they did. You denied, uh, you handed him over and you denied him in the presence of Pilate. Who had, and then he, little chestnut, Pilate was prepared to release him. Remember that. But you weren't. You denied the holy and righteous one again for a second time when you asked for Barabbas to be released. The word for the Greek in that is you actually wanted grace given to Barabbas. And Jesus, you wanted dead. You killed, and here's some other beautiful tension, you killed, you killed the creator of life. Other passages speaks about the author of life. It's a bit of a phrase you see a little bit in the New Testament. The author of life, the originator of life, life himself you put to death. These are really strong words, aren't they? Effectively saying, you're responsible. And you know what? They are responsible. And we're responsible. I just want to just, it doesn't sit brilliantly, though, does it? Because we're not, people in general aren't great at taking responsibility. Have you noticed that in our world, really? We don't want to take responsibility for our actions or for our words. We put it all out there, all over the place. I'm not, not just you, but the world tends to operate like this. So here's my next question. What, is, what does Peter do next? Where would you go next with a message such as this? Well... The reason he's speaking of Jesus Christ at the very beginning is because, again, the center of the message is what God has done in Jesus, which we know to be the grace of God in action. How incredible that that statement of truth was a gracious word. Because that, that naming of that was not to condemn. It was not to condemn. And we know that because have a listen to where Peter goes next. Now, brothers, do you hear even the turn of phrase here? He, he, they were men of Israel a moment ago. And now you can almost imagine Peter bending down and going, Now, brothers, 
I know you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. That's an amazing statement. I know you acted in ignorance. Now, there's another word, isn't it? Ignorance. Anyone know any ignorant people? Yeah, yeah. Anyone ever been ignorant? Yes, isn't that it? Ignorance, my friends. We tend to leave or put ignorance on those that we think deserve to be called ignorant. Generally, people who don't agree with us. All right? Or with unhelpful opinions or whatever. But it's really ignorant, uh, really ignorant, really interesting uh, ignorance in Scripture. And I've gone off on a bit of a rabbit trail during the, during the week. There's so many times where that word ignorance is mentioned. Excuse me. But for Peter to say that I know you acted in ignorance, I know you didn't know what you were doing. I know that. And do you remember who else is ignorant in this? It's Peter, remember? The reason I think he says brothers is just a few moments ago, a few days ago, he was the one that said, I denied Jesus. Remember, they came to Peter and Jesus' arrest. And Peter said, I don't know who you're talking about. I've never, I've never been around this man. Peter locates himself with them and says, this is our position, my friends. You acted in ignorance. Jesus says himself when he's on the cross, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. The words here almost describe a state of ignorance that people uh, that we're in. The Old Testament speaks about sins that were committed in ignorance. People didn't realize. It wasn't that people now that we weren't now guilty of those things. They still happened. I still drove a, tr- a, runaway, a runaway tractor into a quadrangle at a high school. I still did that. I can't deny that that happened. I'd love to. I even feel embarrassed talking about it now, live on camera and stuff. But I, I can't deny that, but it, but it happened. It wasn't my intention. I didn't realize what the implications would be. I didn't know. And I think that's what he's speaking into here to the Jewish people that were gathered. You didn't know, but powerfully, God knew exactly. Even says in, in um, Acts chapter 17, uh, where um, Paul is now speaking to some folks in Athens, to the Greeks in Athens, and he uses this phrase. He says, um, God overlooked the times of ignorance, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent. He says, it's an expression of God's grace. It's an expression of grace to understand that you may not know what you're doing. If I don't know, you don't know what you're doing. Because surely if you did, you would not have crucified the creator of life that I pray you would come to see and come to know. You acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But God, what God foretold through the prophets that his Christ should suffer, he thus fulfilled. So he said, God's already spoken about this. And he'll go on a bit later to say that through Samuel and the prophets, Jesus has, uh, the scriptures have been declaring sorry, that Jesus will suffer, that he is the suffering servant. And again, that was something that they still hadn't grasped. Remember, just leading up to Easter, we heard about them expecting the triumphant king that would ride into town and overthrow the Romans and set everyone straight. And it would just be his presence and his power and his authority with which he would... That's what they were expecting. And he's saying, you never understood. Jesus would suffer. He was to be the suffering servant. And Peter quickly drops to the response. He says, Therefore be, repent and be converted, that your sins may be wiped away, and the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. He really gets to the point pretty quick, doesn't he? He effectively said, All of you are guilty. So here's what you do. You repent and be converted, 
that your sins may be wiped away, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repent is a powerful term. It's more than sorrow. We tend to associate it with being sorry. Uh, But repentance is literally to turn around. To literally to turn around. And to be converted really speaks to the leaving your... um, leaving where you are and turning around and now moving towards. So the the conversion is almost like flee from where you've been and flee to God. Run to God. Run to God as your refuge. Run to God as your strength, as your peace, as the, the source of your love. Run to God. Turn around. Leave these things. Leave this life and run to God. And in that running and in that movement that your sins may be wiped away, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The wiped away is a beautiful promise and a beautiful blessing. And the wiped away literally was describing, and they understood exactly what he was talking about. I mean, we have whiteboards now, so we can get some kind of impression about what wiping away looks like. But for them, their writing was done on papyrus. You've probably seen scrolls in the the, um, documentaries. You've no doubt seen at high school and just YouTubing late at night, you know, papyrus. Well, the ink that they used didn't have any acid in it, interestingly enough. And so what that meant was they would write, but it would never embed itself into the papyrus. It literally would just sit on top. So you had to be so careful with them. And it could be wiped away with a damp cloth. That was a thing. So when, when Paul says your sins are wiped away, they're immediately understanding that, my goodness me, that which I had done and that which I had thought, that when I was in rebellion or I didn't even realize it, when I, when I said, yeah, crucify him, but I didn't know who I was saying to crucify I didn't know. Even if I dare say the person who deliberately said yes, knowing full well what they were doing, the grace was still on offer. The sins are wiped away. It's interesting in Revelation where we we hear about heaven. And there's a phrase which is so often used, a verse so often used at funerals, where your your tears will be wiped away. is exactly the, the same word. It's not just they're wiped away and you still see remembrance. They are literally removed from you. As far as the east is from the west, so your transgressions are from you. So much so that experiencing the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ is so profound that you could... Say, God, I'm so sorry for this, whatever it might be. I'm so sorry for denying you. I'm so sorry for leaving you. I'm so sorry for my greed, for my pride, whatever it might be. I'm sorry. That if you were to go the next day and say, Jesus, just about that thing that I spoke to yesterday, he would literally look at you and have no idea what you're talking about. No idea. Why? Because it's gone. It's actually not there. The impact of that is no longer present. No longer needs to. It's it's gone. East from the west, my friends. Times of refreshing. Times of absolute new life. Absolute new. From the ground up. From the beginning up. This is not new and improved. This is new. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And it's the full, just the way the, when, the blind, when the lame man was healed and he was made whole, that's a word only used here again, the strength, and, and it's literally every part of it was, was strengthened. It's the condition of wholeness is unimpaired health, it's completeness, it's soundness. Completely, complete restoration. 
we're the ones that tend to want to try and hold those things or remember those things or feel it every time it comes up. But this morning, there's this invitation to experience a time of refreshing, which is recognizing that you are forgiven, that I am forgiven, that the message of Jesus Christ is reconciliation to being made right in Jesus Christ. Uh, Just a little thing about me, we've got a couple of pets and I love seeing our pets drink. It's one of the most beautiful parts of having a pet, I reckon. Is any, can I just see if anyone else feels the same way? Or is this just me? Because it could be a weird thing. But to hear that little, all right, maybe it is for me then. Okay, sure. But to, for the dog to run around and go crazy or to go for a long walk and then come back and just hear that lap, 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 lap. It is just me. But that absolute sense, I mean, the deer, the pants, maybe that's what gets me... The deer, the soul that longs after God is like a deer panning for the water. Maybe not a pet deer, but you know, wild deer. But there's this beautiful, just this full on expression. I'm just guzzling, I'm just guzzling, I'm thirsty. That's what Peter's speaking into, into these people who are gathered. Because he looks out and sees people who are, yes, guilty, but they are thirsty. And they're hungry and they're longing. They had no idea. I had no idea who Jesus Christ really was. Times of refreshing might come. Now, when you read this passage, it's really interesting. And it's not completely, I want to say, completely, completely straightforward. Um, He speaks about that he may send, that God may send the one who previously was preached to you, which is Jesus Christ, whom the heavens must receive until the time of restoring what God spoke through all his prophets since the world began. So there's a sense where Jesus is with God in heaven and he will return to restore everything. But these times of refreshing are both to come and they are with us now. For Moses, he says, even spoke of the day that the prophet would write like me, like your brothers, that you shall hear whatever he says to you. And every soul who does not hear what that prophet says will be removed, will be cast away, will be taken away from the people. So folks, responding to Jesus Christ with that heart burst of yes, that times of refreshing may come, that the life that you have lived till this point is not wasted, it's not a waste because all of that has formed you and shaped you. You and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the families and the experiences and the the journey that we've had. It's not a waste. But what I'm saying is all of that does not shape who you are anymore. All of that doesn't define who you are anymore. That has now come under the lordship of Jesus. And he is now restoring those bits. He is now reuniting those bits. He is now bringing to life those bits that you thought had died or been lost. He has come that you might have life and life to the full. He then rolls on to say, all the prophets in Samuel and those who follow, they've always liked, they've also talked about these days. So again, this Jewish group that's gathered, he's reminding them of all the things they've always heard, but never understood. He even goes right back to Genesis where he speaks of Abraham and says, You are the sons of the prophets and the covenant, the promise which God made with our fathers and said to Abraham, In your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so God, now having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to you first to bless you in turning everyone away from your iniquities. Those things which once had you bound, those things which once had you consumed. The things that you thought was the fullness of life, he has said, there is more. In fact, and it's nothing like that. Come to me. Come to me. You know, it's interesting. um, uh, We met as staff. We came back to a staff meeting on Tuesday. Um, And I had some time off, and I was incredibly refreshed. Um, It was weird, uh, because when you're in ministry, 
and my, generally speaking, your work is the people, um, to not have people around me other than my family, who are still work, to, you know, to be honest, but, and I'm still work, don't worry, being with me wasn't exactly a, a beautiful ride, to have me around the house a lot more, um, there were moments of frustration as I worked out what a break really was, and I realized, you know, you know, do you ever had those moments where you start to feel sorry for yourself to the point that you look around and no one else is doing as much as you or as important as you? And have you ever had that feeling? Yeah, that's where long service leave took me for a little bit until I didn't realize really what I was saying. And it was a beautiful rest. And I'm so grateful to our team here who took care of you and ensured that Sundays would gather and all those who pitched in and took on roles and learnt new things and explored new things. Um, I'm so thankful for the way you took care of each other um, over these seven weeks. I did not doubt that you would. I did not think I would come back to a hot mess. I knew that I'd return and it was almost as if I hadn't gone. Um, But we met last Tuesday as staff And on the agenda, we put to talk about Easter. Now, Easter seems like an eon ago, like so far ago, so long ago. And I didn't even, you know, sometimes when you try and reflect on something, you can hardly remember what actually happened anyway. But one thing we did reflect on was that in terms of this community here gathered, it was probably the largest of our Easter's in terms of people who chose to come to services. And we talked about some of the conversations we'd had with people. And that's what led us to talking about what's been going on these last seven weeks and People from our wider community being stirred, being prompted by God, not knowing it was God and wanting to come along, or people who'd met Jesus in other places and wanted to come here. And it's just been beautiful hearing what God is doing in this community in a way that we were reflecting. And I was reflecting and saying, that's just incredible, isn't it? How surprising. And then someone on our team, generally it's Felicity who notices these things, said, well, we did pray for it. And remember, some of us at time, we actually, as leadership, we decided we would fast for some days. Not not lengths of time. One day was hard enough. But we would give over time to, to fast and to pray for this community and to pray for God's blessing and to pray for an outpouring and to pray for hearts to be softened and hearts to be opened. And we sat there, I sat there almost embarrassed. Wow. God did it. But here's the thing, you see. Oh yeah, he did it because we prayed and we fasted. Well, I reflected on that little moment as I reflect on that. And I thought, well, praying and fasting so often just opens our eyes to what God's actually doing. I don't think it starts God acting stuff, but I think what that attitude does is as he recognizes that any person in this community who says, I want to discover more about who God is, that is Jesus being glorified. And whenever someone is welcomed here in Jesus' name, that is Jesus being glorified. And whenever a sermon goes okay, and you're so thankful, that's Jesus being glorified. And when a coffee is given or a prayer is prayed and a healing takes place, God is glorified. When music is played, God is glorified. When our kids are ministered to, God is glorified. When we understand that what we are doing is expressing the kingdom, the fullness, the day of refreshing that is coming and is here, that is when Jesus is glorified. And friends, that's why Peter stood there and said, this has got really very little to do with us. We just did what we saw Jesus doing. We just express what Jesus has done in us. So to invite the team to come back up, we're going to finish with a song. Just to finish up. Um, I'll go to the passage. Really interesting that um, that Jesus... Um, Sorry, Jesus, I just dropped that in when you can't think of another name. Um, But um, when Paul, that's who I was meant to be speaking about. And when Peter was preaching, he was preaching to the Jewish people who were gathered. He had to because they were Jewish. They were really the ones who were there. And they, he said some things which really meant something profoundly to them. And I guess when we share on a Sunday morning in any kind of form, 
when you hear the scriptures open at a life group or wherever it might be, you're really hoping that for that community, you're hearing what God wants you to hear and wants you to know. Because Paul goes on to write to the Ephesians about this encounter with Jesus and the old to the new life. He says, Therefore I say and testify in the Lord that from now on walk not as other Gentiles walk. So now he's not speaking to the Jewish people who had had the prophets. He's speaking to those who aren't Jewish, which is really effectively you and me. He says that you walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vain vanity of their thinking, having their understanding darkened, excluded from the life of God through the ignorance that's within them due to the hardness of their hearts. It's been callous and they've given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. He says, but you didn't learn about Christ in this manner. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, put off the former way of life in the old nature, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new nature created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. Now, that's another long passage to finish. But he's basically saying, listen, before you knew Jesus, there were things that had your passion. There were things that had your attention. There were things that had your thinking. Jan, pretty much they were just all about you. But when you met Jesus Christ, there was a new life that he gave you with new passions and new identity and new ideas and new work even. And he's saying that the difference is that those who are being ignorant, their hearts are hard. And so my my call to you this morning would be, if you're here and Jesus is still something you're working out or working through or just encountering, it's because your heart is being softened. And I'd encourage you to keep that soft heart. If you're with us online and you're checking out church and trying to work out, maybe you've given it one shot today and you got me, so kind of sorry about that. But keep your heart soft. Keep your heart soft. Rach shared about humility even before. Keep your heart soft. We don't need more ignorant people. We need more big-hearted, soft-hearted people, which are not weak and not pathetic. That's not soft-hearted. It's a heart which says, Jesus Christ, I have come to know you as the Lord of all. Have my life. Have my everything. That days of refreshing would come. And that refreshing, just to finish, that's actually a cool breeze, which is not great to preach on a winter, but that's what it is, my friends. Ah, that refreshing of the Spirit of God. Reminding us of everything Jesus said. Amen. Amen. Firm foundation. Let's do it. Let's stand together.
It talks about Jesus being our firm foundation and what Pete was saying about our life glorifying God, glorifying Him in what He's done, glorifying Him in every situation, in, in every conversation, in every action that we have. I think what this, this next part of the song, when the rains came and the wind blew, we know who we are. When those circumstances come that sort of redirect us or circumstances that make, make us question where it is that God has called us to, the place that He has called us, we're reminded again that uh, we have a, a God that is a firm foundation. Sorry, I wasn't sure if that was the end of the song. That's, that's the end of the song. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> hey, I hope that you have been refreshed this morning as we've gathered together. I hope you have uh, experienced a time of refreshing. And we're going to continue in the foyer with tea and coffee and milkshakes, uh, maybe refreshed in a different way. Uh, maybe as we take this time, uh, find someone to talk to and see how you can be refreshment to them. Uh, maybe you can ask some questions. Maybe you can share some things with someone else this morning and be a refreshing, uh, a refreshing person to someone else. So go and have a fantastic week uh, looking to God as our source of refreshment. Amen? Amen. Amen.